Welcome back to another edition of Get Well Acadiana. I'm Dr. Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us today on the show. This is the show that's designed to change your life and change your health for the future. And I appreciate all of you listening. I'm here with my co-host, Brandon Como. Brandon, how are you today? I'm doing well. I tell you, we're going to have a fun show. You know, normally when we come on the show, we talk about serious health concerns, serious issues, major chronic diseases. And I wanted to switch gears a little bit today and and just have a fun show for you guys. We have several different topics that we're going to go over today. I have eight foods that you should eat every single day. I have eight foods that you should avoid completely. Uh, we're going to have eight ways that restaurants make you eat more food whenever you go out to dinner. And then at the end, we'll discuss some food label tips so that when you're reading a food label, you actually know what to look for. And you know, Brandon, over the last, man, however many years I've been doing radio, every disease process, it seems like we discuss, it comes down to one basic thing, and that's inflammation. And if people would look at their food as it being either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, they would be so much better off. The American diet is almost the perfect inflammatory diet. I mean, it, I, I almost couldn't create a better inflammatory diet than just your typical American diet. So as we're reading through these foods today, we're going to start with eight foods you should eat every day. And as we're going through these foods, you'll, be, you, you will, you'll discover that the things you should eat every day are anti-inflammatory, meaning they're going to make you less inflamed. And the things that you should avoid are pro-inflammatory, meaning they're inflaming your body. And, you know, it's, it's well proven and it's agreed to by almost every health practitioner that inflammation is the precursor to almost all chronic diseases. But the question is, what's causing the inflammation? And there's things other than food doing that. But today, we're really going to focus on inflammatory or anti-inflammatory foods. Yeah, that's one thing I've noticed, especially over the last few months, is watching and, and some of the conversations we've had, even you know, off the air, just kind of as I've looked through some of these foods that we're getting ready to talk about, and I notice a difference when I eat some of the healthier version, obviously. Like you said, the, the less, less bloating mm -hmm. uh, of a feel that you get afterwards – um, you know, just less of kind of pain. And it's something that I really, I, I can remember, you know, years, you know, a few years ago, not knowing all of this stuff before I even started reading about this just a few years ago, even before we met, uh, not just thinking, well, that was kind of normally how you feel, I guess, coming off of uh, eating some of these foods, but learning that that's not exactly how it's supposed to be. I always knew I needed to eat healthier, but for me, and just by some of these foods are examples of, you don't have to be someone that is just always consumed in eating fruits and vegetables to be someone that can eat a healthier style of food, you know? Correct. You know, it's, it's, it's so much more than that. And it's funny, being someone who now has turned my health around, I'm down 73 pounds, I went from a 40 waist to a 30 waist, by doing some of these very same things, when I do eat something that's inflammatory, I feel terrible. I mean, I can tell a difference. Most people just feel like that all the time. Right. And you can feel such a difference. So <clears throat> let's get started on the eight foods you should eat every day. And number one on the list is spinach. And I'm not talking about the one from the can. I'm talking about the fresh kind that comes, you know, it's the leaf version of it. Yeah. Spinach is a rich source of almost everything good in nutrition. It's loaded with plant-based omega-3s. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Omega-3s are your healthy fats. And once again, those are anti-inflammatory. That's what fish has in it. That's what uh, nuts have in it. And, and avocados, that's your healthy oils. And what you're going to see is fat does not make us fat. Sugar and carbohydrates make us fat. So spinach is loaded with omega-3s and vitamins. And it's really good for things like muscle building and memory and heart health. Um, it's loaded with something called folate. Folate is a vasodilator, which is very good for us. It increases our blood flow. Um, it's great for your heart. It increases blood flow also to your reproductive organs, which, you know, is good for men. Um, and it's also loaded with lutein, which is shown to help with age-related problems and eye problems. 
And so I make salads with it, sandwiches with it. I put it in my scrambled eggs. I put it in my tacos. I really try to eat it every chance I get. And so, yeah, folate is a vasodilator, and that's a real good thing for us. See, here's something, Doc, that I always – okay, you mentioned salads. I'm not a salad person. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, my wife has kind of implemented vegetables little by little um, over the past couple of years. Spinach, when I look at it in its leaf version, I, I can't get into that. Yeah, okay? yeah. But what she'll do is she'll put it in a, a smoothie mix that she yeah. have. And so I don't even really taste it when she puts it in a smoothie mix, you know? Great, great idea. You know, absolutely. You get one of the little Nutribullet blenders yeah. and you throw spinach and some other stuff in there and you don't even realize it's in there. But yeah. again, you're getting it in. Yeah, she tricked me as a matter of fact. She, t- she told me, she said, there was actually something very healthy I put in there and you don't even realize. I said, what was it? She said, spinach. <laughs> I said, are you kidding me? I really ate spinach? Yeah. Said, yeah, it was in your, uh, it was in your smoothie. So. You know, people think, of, people have this sort of all or none mentality. Like, I don't eat salads, so I don't eat vegetables. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I can take a little small handful of spinach and throw it in some scrambled eggs. And, again, you barely even know it's in there. Yeah. And you don't taste it in there. But it's just one little way. It's little baby steps. Yeah. You know, add a little bit here and there. Or instead of throwing lettuce on a taco, I'll throw a little, little bitty handful of spinach on there. Mm-hmm. Um, little bitty baby steps like that makes a huge difference. So, yeah, that's a great plan. That's a great idea. Throw it, in the, throw it in a smoothie. Now, let me ask you this. And this might sound like a dumb question, so forgive me if it is. But say if you, you know, for a healthier snack, okay, spinach and artichoke dip, that's been something I was introduced a couple years ago as well. Come to love it. And is that really, you know, as healthy as it sounds, a spinach and artichoke dip or not really? I mean, it's probably not that healthy. It kind of depends on how it's made. If you probably made it in your kitchen and you really made an effort to make it healthy, like say you made it with grass-fed butter and you made it with, you know, it's probably an organic spinach. Take take the spinach and cook it down yourself yeah. instead of bringing it out of a can. And, okay. you know, take fresh artichokes. It'd probably be healthier that way. Right. Probably the restaurant version is not that healthy, but it's it's probably healthier than some other choices. Okay. But um, it does have some spinach in there, so yeah. it, it can't hurt you, you know. <laughs> it, it's probably better than nothing. Yeah. Uh, so number two on our list is blueberries. And these should actually be called brain berries because they are a brain superfood. Um, I eat them every chance I get. In fact, I try to eat a cup of blueberries every day. You know, the way I do my nutrition is I track my macronutrients. I track my carbohydrates, proteins, and fats every day. And I use an app called MyFitnessPal, which is really beneficial because it has a barcode scanner on it. You just scan what you're eating. It puts it right in there. And the way we do our diet is we track our macronutrients, which is way more important than tracking calories. So I always use this as an example to these calorie or point counters or these calorie trackers. Mm -hmm. One piece of chocolate cake is 500 calories. Three chicken breasts are 500 calories. If I'm counting calories, those two things are exactly the same. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Unfortunately, they are not Uh the same. Uh -uh. So we track macronutrients. And for my portion that I've allotted for my carbohydrates throughout the day, I try to make a big portion of those carbohydrates vegetables and berries and and blueberries especially so if you're tracking macronutrients for instance with calories you just gave a number 500 okay there's always a goal with how many calories well what's the goal i guess in numbers with macronutrients yeah that's a great question so for protein we try to do 0.8 to 1 gram per pound of body weight okay. um of course with me being a bodybuilder that's up some you know i had a little more protein than than most yeah. um carbohydrates are really depends on what your goal is okay. Someone that's just an average person who's trying to lose weight, we usually do between kind of that 50 and 100 carbohydrate grams a day. Mm -hmm. Now, when I'm heavy competing, doing bodybuilding, that that might go up to like 300. But if if you'll track your carbohydrates, some people are probably like 300 to 500 and they're not even working out. That loads your body up with insulin. That signals fat storage. So carbohydrates are a big key. Well, you mentioned carbohydrates because... I know for me, okay, if, you, if you're if you a regular person that really doesn't pay a whole lot of attention to what you eat, then 50 to 100 carbs might not sound like a lot. But if you've thought a lot about it and you've gone on low-carb diets, that sounds like a lot. I mean, I could think of, you know, diets and specifically low-carb, you know, trying to eat anywhere from about 13 to about 20 carbs a day. So 50, 50 carbs sounds so different, but I, I'm sure you can atta- you can talk about this a little bit. There's been 
while a lot of those diets do work in some instances, uh, they can get weight off of people. Uh, at the same time, there's kind of been maybe this miseducation that's been out there about carbs. Uh, yeah, so the problem with zero-carb diets or super, super low-carbohydrate diets like that is it kills your metabolism. Yeah. It also kills your brain activity. So you don't feel good while you're doing that. Right. You have to have enough carbs to fuel your day. Yeah. And what I normally, well, for me, it, to be specific, so I will do um, about 25% of my carbs before my workout and 25 after. Okay. But what I tell people is on your days you're going to get more activity, mm -hmm. you can up your carbohydrates a little bit, like on your gym days or your yeah. exercise days or your walk days. On the days that I don't work out, on my rest days, I lower those carbs because I'm not burning them. Right. So it really is tailored to the each individual person. You can't just sort of give this broad brush. But general, generally speaking, lower carbohydrate, higher protein is kind of the diet that we go with. Mm -hmm. And then the third aspect of that is your healthy fats. Mm -hmm. Healthy fats are so good for your body. And there, I could do a whole show on healthy fats, but here's the bottom line of it. If you run your body mostly off of healthy fats, it's a cleaner burning fuel. Kind of like in your car, mm -hmm. you know, there's cleaner burning fuels like propane cars are cleaner burning right. than, you know, than gasoline, that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, a gasoline's cleaner burning than diesel. So burning your, running your body off of fat is a cleaner burning fuel for your body. And the good thing about that is you don't develop antioxidants in your body, which are kind of waste products, which give you cancer and age you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, Generally speaking, 50 to 100 carbs is, is a low enough. The person's going to lose two or three pounds a week. Okay. So we don't want to do these crash kind of diets where we, you know, where you're just, where you, you, you feel terrible. And yeah. that's a short term thing because the person doesn't follow it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, number three on our list is walnuts. And this is something that most people don't realize. Walnuts are higher in omega-3 oils than salmon. They're loaded with more anti-inflammatory polyphenols than red wine, and they pack half the protein of chicken. So walnuts are almost the perfect food for you to have a healthy snack. And lately, I've been putting walnut butter in my oatmeal in the mornings and using walnut butter in place of peanut butter or almond butter. And walnuts are super healthy for your heart and your brain, preventing dementia. Walnuts are almost one of those perfect foods. I didn't even know they had walnut butter. I knew about almond butter because I've yeah. had that before, but walnut butter? It's hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it is. It's usually on the bottom shelf off yeah. to the side, you know, uh -huh. at, at, at that weird grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, that brings me to number four on our list, which are oats. Mm. Oats are so healthy for you. They're loaded with 10 grams of protein for half a cup serving. They deliver steady, muscle-friendly energy. So out of, again, we talk about those carbohydrate allotment for the day. Oats and blueberries would be a really good two carbohydrates to pack in there. Mm -hmm. um, they also are, are very high in fiber. Almost no Americans get enough fiber in their diet. And that's so important that we do because it slows down insulin. It reduces fat storage. It helps your digestive system. And so getting more fiber is very, very important for us to get. And oats are one of those things that's really rich in fiber. And so is walnuts. Walnuts are rich in fiber as well. Hmm. Oats, yeah. I've got some uh, oat cereal at the house right now. I actually enjoy it pretty much. Yes. Now, the type of oats I like, they have one called Bob's Red Meal Oats, which okay. are less processed. Okay. So when you look at oatmeal, mm -hmm. there's different process levels. Steel-cut oats are your least processed oatmeal. Um. Those have, they basically cut those off, put them in a bag, they cut, cut them from the plant, put them in the bag, and that's steel cut oats. They're also called Irish oats. Now, I chose to skip those because I can't get into them. I just can't figure out a way to make them where I like them. Mm -hmm. One step up from that is the called old fashioned oats. What that is, is they steam them and they run them through a, a wheel that flattens them. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones I eat. They're the least processed but still tastiest. So I like Bob's Red Meal Old Fashioned Oats. And then one step up from that is your, um, is your quick oats. Those have already been cooked and re-dehydrated, and that's the ones that you can cook in like 30 seconds in the microwave. Um, those 
don't quite have as much fiber. They're not quite as heart healthy because they've already been cooked and reprocessed and you lose a lot of those vitamins and, and, and healthy aspects of it whenever you, uh, w- the more you process them. So I prefer the old fashioned version of the oatmeal and uh, I still cook it in the microwave, but it takes just a little longer. You know, it's like a three minute cook in the okay. microwave. The instant oats are the least healthy ones. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And then the fifth one on my list is yogurt. <clears throat> I'm not usually one to recommend yogurt at all, but I put it on the list and here's why. Most yogurts that you get, like you see these ladies that, that they'll eat yogurt for breakfast and think they're being healthy. Right. <laughs> Most of those yogurts are loaded with sugar and chemicals and the, the quote unquote fruit that they have in the bottom of it yeah. is kind of like more like a jam or a jelly. Yeah. It's loaded with sugar and some of its artificial flavorings and colorings and it's just not that healthy. So if you, it, the good part about yogurt though is it's, it has active enzymes and bacteria that support digestive health. So the best thing to do is get a Greek yogurt, unflavored, and put your blueberries in there. Oh, okay. And, and so it. then you can get and you can put walnuts on top yeah, if you want. There you go. So you see, you can you can make some healthy choices, okay. um, and and still be able to eat you know pretty pretty tasty stuff. Good. So. The look, well, I'm thinking of the yogurts, and I'm thinking of that little jam and stuff you're talking about at the bottom. Even if you get some Greek yogurt that has some of that stuff in it, you would say that stuff is probably not like the the stuff at the bottom, the fruit flavoring stuff. Yeah, is probably not the best for you. And just put your own fruits in. It, exactly, okay. you're so much better putting your own stuff. And you know, I usually try to buy three or four bins of the little organic blueberries mm-hmm. a week, and 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 I'll buy four or five of them. That'll usually last me for the week because I try to eat a cup a day. Mm-hmm. And you can take some unflavored Greek yogurt, throw you some blueberries and walnuts in there, and you're back on eating super healthy stuff, and it tastes great. Now, number six on the list is tomatoes. Tomatoes are packed with lycopene, which has been shown to reduce risk of every cancer known to man. Bladder, lung, prostate, skin, stomach, all cancers. Lycopene is a cancer fighter. Now, here's the interesting thing about tomatoes. Uh Uh-huh. Processed tomatoes are just as good as fresh tomatoes are. All right, so you're telling me ketchup is good for me? Ketchup is good for you. Dude, I love ketchup. With man. one caveat. You know, there's always a caveat. Yeah, of one, the, the one thing is, is some ketchups contain glutamate. Okay. That is a neuroexcitatory chemical that they add to it to make you think it tastes even better than it does. Uh-huh. It excites your nervous system. It excites your brain. And they put it in like monosodium glutamate or just regular glutamate. If you see that... Now we've, we're, we're ticking towards more of an unhealthy. So, okay. and, and, you know, I buy an organic ketchup without this chemical, and I could not tell the difference. If you did a taste test between the two, I couldn't tell the difference. But it still is regular old ketchup. But, yes, processed ketchup actually has a higher absorption rate than regular tomatoes do. Sweet. So ketchup is healthy for you Sweet. as long as it doesn't have glutamate. Okay. A glass of tomato juice is great for you every day as long as you kind of watch the sodium. Um, but tomatoes are super healthy, and so are carrots. That's number seven. Carrots, kind of the same thing. It's spiked with carotenoids, which are associated with a reduced cancer risk and, and very anti-inflammatory. And as you guys see, almost every one of these foods go in the anti-inflammatory category, and that's so important for the American diet. And the last one before the break is black beans. They contain a color, and generally that black color, the more color something is, the healthier it is for you. And what that what colors black beans is something called anthocyanins, and this is a superfood that boosts brain power and supports heart and, you know, we usually have a, um, a pot of those cooked and just sitting around throughout the week, and we add them to salads, scrambled eggs. We put them on wraps. And so as we're making our food, we throw a little spinach or a little black bean or a little walnut. You know, we just try to add these things into our diet a little bit at a time. And that's the best way to take care of this is slowly start to add these foods into your diet. You know, people get stuck in eating like the same 10 or 15 things throughout their whole life, and it's usually the same 10 or 15 things they were raised on, and it's time to break out of that mold. Step number one is just buy these things. If you don't have them in your kitchen and you don't have them readily available, you're not going to go to the trouble to fix them. So that's why it's so nice to have a pre-washed, 
little tub of spinach and a pre-washed thing of blueberries and and some walnuts handy and a pot of black beans fixed where you can just sort of throw these things together and make a quick meal. You know, my mer- my version of fast food is, you know, a microwaved uh, oatmeal and throw some blueberries or a, a Greek yogurt with some blueberries in it. And so you can make fast meals. Don't say that you don't have time to eat healthy because it's not the case. These things don't take that long if you pre-prepare and you have them where you can just throw them together. Very good. Well, listen, we have after break, we're going to have eight foods you should avoid and why. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. I'm Dr. Kevin from the Bryant Wellness Institute. You're welcome to join us on our Facebook page. We discuss issues like this every day on our Facebook page at the Bryant Wellness Institutes. And I also have a show Thursdays at noon called Dr. Kevin Live and Online. And the neat thing about that show is you can get on there and join in. You can ask questions and it pops right up on my screen. And we can have discussions. If you have a question about any of these things I'm talking about, you can ask it. Pops right up on my screen and, and, and we can interact. So don't forget to join us on our Facebook page at the Bryant Wellness Institutes. And we've got eight foods to avoid when we get back. Welcome back to Get Well Acadiana with Dr. Kevin. Thank you for coming back with us today. Before the break, we had eight foods you should eat every day. And in this segment, I'm going to tell you eight foods that you should avoid and why. And you remember we talked about some foods are pro-inflammatory, meaning they make you inflamed, and some foods are anti-inflammatory. And what you're going to see is most of these foods to avoid is it's because they create inflammation. If you would make two categories with your diet instead of most people think, what's going to make me gain weight or not? If you would focus more on what's making me inflamed and not inflamed, the weight loss just happens naturally. So number one on the list of our foods to avoid is margarine. Margarine is one of the largest mistakes ever created in the food industry. You know, back in the 80s, we switched from butter to margarine because it was promoted as this heart-healthy alternative to this fatty butter. But it's trans fats. That's the most heart-clogging, inflammation-causing fat that you can eat. So margarine was a huge mistake. If you're still eating margarine, please switch back to a grass-fed organic butter and your, you will, your, your body will be less inflamed, you will lose weight, and it will be so much better for your body. Number two on the list is processed meats, things like hot dogs. These have been shown time and time again to contribute to colon cancer. And colon cancer is one of those things that that can be very, very devastating. The World Health Organization just ranked these processed meats in a group one ranking, which is also in the same group as asbestos and smoking. So processed meats, and listen, our kids eat a lot of hot dogs. That's the worst thing for their and colon sandwiches health. Too. Yeah, and sandwiches too. Yeah. yeah. And and these things are are very, very bad because of the nitrites and the chemicals that they put in there. So I get my son these organic uh, uh, grass-fed beef hot dogs. Um, I, th- I think most of the grocery stores have them, and he doesn't know the difference, uh, and, and they're way, way better for him. And then number three on the list is something that I've been talking about for years, and that's farm-raised fish. Guys, when you go to the store and you buy these tilapia from Thailand and from Vietnam, and you go make your fish tacos and you think that they're healthy, these are toxic disasters. If you were to see the waste pits that these tilapia are raised in, it would gross you out if I told you about it, but just trust me, these are very toxic disasters. Things you know, they're feed, they're fed antibiotics that are banned in the United States. Many times, they're fed waste products, and um, all types of unhealthy stuff are put in the water. And so, you're much better off if you're going to eat fish with a cold water fish from the north. Something like an Alaskan wild caught salmon is so much better than these tilapia from thailand and vietnam and these third world countries so is there a tilapia that is raised properly that is sold at the stores not really not really they're all if you look at them they're almost all um well and that's what somebody told me they had said you know hey you don't want the ones that you were just talking about 
Um, and, and I was like, well, what's the other version that I'm supposed to look for? And I can never find anything else besides what you were just talking about. And that's all I was wondering. It's like, is there somebody that has them? Yeah. I like tilapia, but I don't I, I don't want to think about the crap that I'm yeah. putting in me when they're being fed. You're so much better off with a cold water fish. Okay. If you if you want a white fish like that and you don't want salmon, get like an Alaskan um, cod or okay. something like that. You know, the further up north and the colder the water, the better. It's okay. so much cleaner up there. Okay. Um, but yeah, pretty much all of the tilapia that you get is from these third world countries and it's, it's super, super toxic. And that's even the stuff in the restaurants too, that they make the more than likely. Yeah. Yeah. So now there are some places that are like fish restaurants that'll give you a healthy fish, but you know, fish is one of those things that's mislabeled more, more often than it's not. Right. Many times what they tell you they're bringing you is not even what they are actually bringing you. So you be real careful with your fish. Fish is one of those things that's been thought of as healthy for our whole lives. Yeah. But now, because there's so many toxins in PCBs and heavy metals out there, you really got to be careful with fish these days. Yeah. Now, number four on the list is non-organic eggs. And there's a scientific study by John Hopkins, and they found that poultry on factory farms are routinely fed things like caffeine and Tylenol and Benadryl, banned antibiotics they even found where some chickens were being fed prozac to keep them calm in their cages where they can't move so it's very important that if you're going to eat eggs that you eat organic cage free eggs and my favorite brand and i did some research on this is eggland's best and i don't have any stake in the company i don't own stock um but eggland's best really did set out about 20 years ago to build a healthier egg And what they found is if you feed the chickens corn, you're going to have unhealthy eggs because that's inflammatory. If you feed them more healthy fats, then those healthy fats are going to get transferred into the eggs. Man, I've been talking about this stuff for years. So eat grass-fed organic eggs, and they're so much healthier for you. And I'm not one of these guys that thinks eating eggs is bad for you. I probably eat a dozen eggs every week, and my cholesterol is lower than almost anybody's. And so, you know, eating cholesterol does not make you have high cholesterol. That's been debunked. Number five on the list is American cheese. You're breaking my heart with this one. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I love some cheese, especially American cheese. Yeah. So remember when we were kids, the individually wrapped plastic wrapped cheese? (laughs) I could eat that by itself. Yeah, I I did too as a kid. And you know, that's not even actually cheese. If you read the ingredients, it's milk fats and milk solids and whey proteins and emulsifiers and food colorings. And so get a real cheese. Like real cheese is not bad for you, like an aged cheddar or ricotta or, you know, like I try to get maybe like more of the Sargento, like a real cheese. And it's so much better for you than the old individually wrapped oh, American man. cheese that we, I don't know how many slices of that I ate yeah. as a kid. Oh, I used to it destroy so much. that cheese sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd, cheese and I'd mayonnaise. wrap up my hot dog wieners and yeah, cheese. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's like a double whammy right there. Exactly. So we can do better, and especially for our kids. Now, number six is microwave popcorn. So the bag is lined with perfluorinated chemicals. This has been shown to disrupt our hormonal system, like our thyroid and our female and our kind of our reproductive and depression anxiety hormones. And so I get a bag of microwave popcorn that's that's, – it's an organic microwave popcorn, and the bag's all natural. It doesn't contain these chemicals in it. And, uh, you know, I think everybody's pretty aware of the microwave popcorn thing. That's been around for a while. You know, people have pretty much know that already. That's That's been in the news. You know, it's one of the most popular items uh, that people eat around here. What's that? Microwave popcorn. Is it microwave popcorn? <laughs> here, here, here in the studios. <laughs> uh, somebody, as a matter of fact, made a comment to me yesterday. He said, Brandon, is somebody popping popcorn every single day in this building? Because I <laughs> smell it every day. It's quick I said, and pretty easy. much. Well, yeah, it's quick and easy, especially if we're eating and we're kind of on the go doing our stuff over here. Yeah. You, you know, it's, it's a very popular food item over here. Now, number seven on the list, and this is going to make so many of you upset with me. And that are these frappuccinos and these caramel macchiato drinks that you guys stop and get. These things are a sugar and calorie disaster. So some of these, like, you know, macchiato, double double caramel, frappuccino, whatever it is that you get, some of these things have 50 grams of sugar in them. So, and this is a lot like some of these smoothies, too. You have to watch these smoothies. You know, these things aren't necessarily always healthy, even though they're promoted as healthy. A lot of these things are really, really high in sugar, which spikes your insulin, which causes you to store fat. 
And so drink real coffee. Uh, the sweetener that I like to use is stevia. Stevia is an all-natural sweetener that's really healthy for you. It's not bad at all. And you'll be doing your waistline a big favor. And then number eight on the list is the old white bread. The problem with white bread is it has a really high glycemic index, and that means that it spikes your insulin. And this causes your body to flood uh, blood sugar, and that signals fat storage. And so the slower the carbohydrate or better, opt, opt for a whole grain alternative, you know, or even much healthier than that, try to reduce as much bread intake as you can. Um, try to try to eat, try to eat things that aren't bready if you can. And if you do try to eat a whole grain alternative, be much healthier for you. All right. Thanks for that, guys. Uh, we will be back right after this break. We are going to have eight ways restaurants are making you eat more food when you go out to dinner. And this is so funny. Wait till you hear this. I'm Dr. Kevin. This is Get Well Acadiana. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Get Well Acadiana with Dr. Kevin. We're having some fun on the show today talking about different food items and dietary tips. So before the break, we were discussing eight things that you should avoid. And in this segment, I want to tell you eight ways restaurants are making you eat more food whenever you go. Because you all know you leave the restaurant absolutely stuffed where you can't even button your pants many times. And so there's different things that these food companies do to trick you into eating more food. And number one is colors. Have you ever noticed how all fast food restaurants use red and yellow? That's not a coincidence. Red makes you eat faster and more forcefully, and yellow stimulates your appetite, causing your brain to secrete serotonin, wanting you to eat more food. So even the colors that the restaurants are painted or that the food places are painted makes a big difference. So I guess the the bottom line of that is don't paint your kitchen red or yellow. Yeah. It would, would not be, that make you eat more food. Wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a good idea. Now, number two is television. Eating in front of the television can increase your calorie intake by, get this, 71% in some studies that they did, that they do. So if you eat at your house in front of the television, you can increase your, your food intake by 71% because you're not paying attention to it. You're not actually focused on what you're eating. You're focused on the television. Mm. And so if you go to a restaurant that has a television, try to face away from it or don't pay attention to it or sit at a booth that, that doesn't have a television, buy it. But that's why you see all these televisions everywhere is because it increases the food bill by 71% and many times. And number three has to do with colors again, but this time it's the colors of your food. Now, this one's tough for me because... We just talked about that having foods that are bright in colors means they're full of phytonutrients. And generally speaking, brighter color foods are healthier. But they did a study where they took a bowl of M&Ms and one group was given seven colors and the other group was given 10 colors. And the group that was given 10 colors ate 77% more. Hmm. And this was repeated over and over and the results were always the same. That's why junk food is given bright colors using, using artificial colorings. So basically, Brandon, if all the M&Ms were brown, you'd eat 77% less. Well, and I mean, I could see that if you, if you use the M&M uh, example because with the different colors, it almost feels like you're eating something new. Even if, it's, even if the flavoring is the same, it's like you're eating something new as opposed to a dull color like brown. Yeah. It's not an inviting color. And even though they taste yeah. the same, you pick out like your favorite color. Isn't exactly. You? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that it encourages you to eat more. Now, number four, and I know you guys have all noticed this before, this is artificial smells. So smells can be one of the most powerful motivators to what we eat and to what we put in our bodies. In fact, there's entire companies that produce artificial smells to pump into the air to influence your food order. One company called Scent Air has duplicated waffle cones, popcorn, Cinnabons, even grilled hamburgers, and they pump this out into the, into the public to try to get you to take action to eat. You know, we've all been at the mall, and we walk by the cookie place or the pretzel place, and, and we smell these things baking and stopped and got one. Well, some places have fans that pump that smell out into the <laughs> mall on purpose because they know that that's going to make you stop and get one. 
And then number five on the list when we go out is free bread. Have you ever wondered why they bring you free bread? Like, is that, are they doing that just because they're generous? Well, research proves that those people that ate the bread actually ate 16% more food that they paid for than those that didn't. So this is a double hit to your waistline. First of all, you eat the bread, and then you turn around and eat 16% more food at the same time. So tell your waiter to skip the bread. If you're really hungry, order a salad or order some sort of a little protein appetizer. But... Bread, bread is a double whammy to the waistline. And then number six is we supersize it. It seems like you're getting a deal because of the larger size is only a few cents more. But what it costs by upsizing things in your waistline is a tremendous blow. And so don't supersize things just because it's a few cents more. Number seven on the list is drinks with your meal. Now, people don't realize how many calories they're drinking in in addition to the food that they eat every day. So always pay attention to the amount of calories and the amount of carbohydrates and sugar that you're taking in in, your, in what you drink. And then we have alcohol before you eat. So who doesn't like to go have a few drinks before you, before you have your meal? And here's the problem with that. Your body will digest the alcohol first which increases the insulin output, causing fat storage to kick in stronger. And also, those people that drank booze ate an extra 200 calories during their meal. So if you drink, I mean, I have drinks before, before a meal whenever I go out to eat. So my point with that is you don't have to stop doing that. Just be a little more aware of it. Yeah. Just be, you know what, I've had some drinks, so I'm going to pay a little bit extra attention to how much food I'm eating and, you know, there's nothing wrong with sipping on a bourbon or two before you before you eat, but just pay attention and say, you know, I've had a few drinks. I'm going to make sure that I don't overeat and stuff myself just because I've my inhibitions are a little loosened. And then number eight is food advertising is literally everywhere. We have billboards, commercials, magazines. Most restaurants spend more on outward, outdoor advertising than any other industry because they work. And, you know, we all remember the commercial of the, you know, the girls in the bikini with the big hamburger from Carl's Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and I bet that wasn't really what was happening there. And so um, watch out for the food advertising. Don't be manipulated to eat foods that you normally wouldn't by some of this advertising or some of this uh, some of these commercials that you see on television. All right, so that's eight ways that you're tricked into eating more food, and I want you to pay attention to these things next time you decide to go out and eat because if you do, you'll end up eating less, and that'll benefit your waistline and benefit your health. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Get Well Acadiana with Dr. Kevin. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're discussing several different things that you should know about your diet today. And ways that you're being manipulated by the food industry. And, you know, two-thirds of Americans are now overweight. One-third of Americans are obese. We have to get this under control. And I have six food label tricks that you should know about today. And, you know, the food industry is not interested in your health. They're not interested in being honest with you about what you're eating. And they're not interested in providing you with the things that will extend your life or, or, or you knowing what you're, or what's in the food they make. They're interested in one thing, and that's sales. They'll label things that will make you pick up the food and put it in your basket. One example lately is they put the word protein on the front of everything. That has been shown to increase sales. I've been guilty of that one myself because I'm always trying to increase my protein. So if I'm walking down the aisle and I see something with protein on it, I'll pick it up and at least read the label. But many times it doesn't have any more protein on it than anything else. Also, the words natural will increase sales. Nowadays, it seems like every food label is designed to make you think it's something that it's not. The vast majority of Americans studied stated that they use food labels to determine if an item is healthy, but the vast majority of people don't know what the legal rules are on the labels that they're reading. So they don't even know what, what they're actually uh, reading and how that relates to what's in the food. Now, in most cases, 
the legal rules of what's on the packaging and especially on the front can be pretty deceptive. So I've come up with six things to consider the next time that you read a label on food and you have to read the fine print on the back to really know what the story is. And number one on the list is made with. For instance, made with real cheese or made with real fruit. We've all seen that. So in your mind, you think, oh, that's a good source of fruit. I'm going to pick that up. Or that's a good source of protein. I'm going to pick that up. The truth is, it means that it may have the tiniest little bit of that ingredient in it. Since it says made with, it's not regulated by the FDA. That means that I could take a 55-gallon drum of corn syrup and I could put a quarter of a cup of fruit juice in it and put made with real fruit on the front. And parents think, oh, this is made with real fruit. I'm going to get this for my kids. And it has absolutely nothing to do with what the actual majority of the food is. And so you have to watch this made with label. What you have to do is turn it over and read the list of ingredients and the highest percentage of food in there is the first one listed down to the least. So you'll see something that says made with real fruit, and that might be sixth or seventh thing listed on the food label. And you know it has very little of it in there. Same thing number two is natural. You think, well, Dr. Kevin's been harping on us to eat more natural, so I'm going to buy this one. It says natural on it. There is almost no regulation on what that means. And by the time natural food is processed, it may be far from natural. So I could take corn and make high fructose corn syrup out of it and call it natural. The word natural means very little. And people confuse natural with organic. And they could not be further from different. I mean, they're very, very different. So natural does not necessarily mean anything. If you see that, you have to look on the back for what it actually is. Now, number three on the list is lightly sweetened. You think, oh, good, it has very little sugar in it. But the question is, what does lightly mean? Actually, it means not much. Lightly is a relative term. So I could dump a ton of sugar in the normal one and then put out a second one that says lightly sweetened. And there's really no FD regu FDA regulation on the term lightly sweetened. But it sounds good. So I'm trying to reduce my sugar, and this one says lightly sweetened, so I'm going to get that. So if it has three-quarters cup of sugar instead of, instead of a whole cup of sugar, is that better for you? Well, probably not that much. And so these food industry giants like General Mills and Monsanto and Nabisco and Kellogg, all of these big, we call them the food industry or, 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 or the, giant food, the food giants, they really do everything they can to do one thing, and that's make you pick it up and put it in your basket. Now, number four on the list is reduced or low or light on the front. Like it'll say low calories or reduced calories or reduced sugar. And once again, that's a vague term. Um, they can take what normally has a cup of sugar and put three quarters and call it reduced. It doesn't really mean a whole lot. Neither does the word free. For example, something can say fat-free on it, and in the food industry lingo, that means almost free. Fat-free food can still contain a half a gram per serving, a half a, fat, a half a gram of fat per serving. Sugar-free can still contain a half a gram of sugar per serving. So that's not free. Um, but again, it sounds like it is, so it makes you want to buy it. Now, here's the other problem. When they take the fat out of something and make it fat-free, that usually means they put something else in like sugar. Or when they say sugar-free, that means they usually put artificial sweeteners like this aspartame or, you know, Splenda or some of these other chemicals in it. There are no free lunches. Usually when they take something away, they add something else. Number six on the list is high in fiber. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but fiber is something that almost none of us get enough of, but now we get to the, to the discussion of what kind of fiber. You know, there's something that's called cellulose that they put in our food, and they call that fiber, and it's basically wood chips. Cellulose is chopped up wood, and that's what they use as fiber. 
So they take a candy bar and they put wood chips in it and call it a fiber one bar and you buy it thinking it's healthy. It's not necessarily so. Fiber needs to be fiber that's found in fruits and vegetables and beans and peas and lentils and leafy green vegetables. Like real food is the type of fiber that we need in our diet. So I hope that you've enjoyed these tips and I really hope that they've made you realize that you can't just run through the grocery store and look at the front of the box and grab a few things and 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 hope that that you come out healthier because of that. You have to really take time to study these things on the back of the packaging and look at the nutrient content. Something else you should look at is portion sizes. A lot of these companies will put two to four servings in one package. For example, a Pop-Tart. You know, Pop-Tart, you look at it and it has 16 grams of sugar and 36 grams of carbohydrates and all kinds of nasty chemicals, but there's two servings in a package. So you're actually getting 32 grams of sugar and 72 grams of carbohydrates. So you have to look at the portions and multiply the sugar and carbohydrates times the portions. And if you're going to eat everything in the package, that's actually what you're getting. So now you can begin to understand why two thirds of us have weight problems. Everyone we check almost is inflamed. You know, inflammation is the precursor to almost all chronic diseases. And so many people that we check are overweight and inflamed and developing diabetes or prediabetes. These are the type of things that we address in our health programs at Bryant Wellness. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, you can get on our Facebook page at the Bryant Wellness Institutes. I'm always on there discussing these type of topics and, you know, trying to educate the public on ways that you can turn this around and ways that you can turn your kids health around. And if you ever want to sit down with me to try to figure out ways that maybe we can reduce your health, I'm a certified weight loss coach, nutritionist. We discuss this with all of our patients that need our help. You can give me a call at my office at 837-7174. I'd love to sit down with you and see if I could develop a nutritional plan for you to get you back on the right track and finally get you down to that goal weight once and for all. And we do it easily and naturally without starving, without eating like a rabbit. We eat real solid, healthy food and the weight comes off naturally. Thank you for joining me. Brandon appreciated the show today. You guys have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.